Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Man, I'm so glad you guys are here. Are you guys excited to be here? You ready for church? Yeah. Turn to somebody and say, I'm ready for church. Awesome. Well, my name's Robert, and uh, this is Arrows Church. And if you're looking for a community where everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, and with Jesus, anything is possible, you found it. So congratulations, you did that. Uh, we, we like to highlight some of our volunteers, and today I want to highlight somebody that I don't even know is here today. I'm looking, but I don't know if Sam Daubert is here today. Anybody seen Sam? Hey, that'll work. We'll celebrate you. So Sam, if you don't know Sam, uh, he helps us out at Arrows Kids, and uh, he is in charge, uh, well, he set up and sort of manages our kids' check-in process, and if you know anything about kids' check-in, that needs to go well and seamless and all of that, and he has been on the team since before day one and has just been super faithful to us, and so uh, if everybody can let Sam know when you see him, and we'll let his mom know. Thank you so much. Uh, we love him and his family, so... Some of you are, are brand new to Arrows, and so I'm not really going to ask you to consider serving, uh, but some of you are more than one week old. And so if that's you, then I am going to consider you, I am going to uh, ask you to consider serving so many different areas that we have here between kids and prayer team and tech team and setup and tear down and guest services and worship and all the things. We have a spot for you if uh, you have abilities, and the best way you can do that is go online to arrows.church slash volunteer, fill out that form, or if you prefer the analog version, uh, grab that uh, Next Steps card that's somewhere close by to you, fill out that, I'd like to begin serving somewhere, and we will be in contact with you. I have a big announcement regarding the next location of Arrows Church. And I will give that to you next week, because <laughs> I know how much you guys love that. So please don't come up to me and say, hey, I already know I'm not going to be here, so can you tell me? Uh, I don't know. Depends on where you're going to take me to lunch. So <laughs> let me pray for us uh, as we get going. Father God, we do come to you. We celebrate what you've done. We celebrate what we believe that you can do. We thank you for what you have done, and we acknowledge that you're not done doing it, that you're still doing it, and you're doing things that only you can do. You're still a God who does God-like things, and so we ask that you do those things today in this room. We pray that you awaken us where we need to be awakened and, and, and put to sleep those things in us that need to be put to sleep. And not just kind of, not just for a little bit, we're not asking for spiritual ambient. We're asking you to put to death the things that are in us that keep us from focusing on you. Keep us do it from doing the things that you've called us to do. We are going to open and look at your living, breathing word today. And we ask that you allow it to speak to us. Holy Spirit, remind us what only you can do today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're starting a new series today. Uh, where we're going to start looking at the Sermon on the Mount. If you have been in church pretty much in any capacity, you've probably heard of the Sermon on the Mount. It's uh, one of the, the best-known sections of, of Jesus' teachings. We're, go we're calling this Sermon on the Mount Part 1, because truthfully is, there's so much there, we're not even going to get through it before December gets here. And in December, we want to spend some time focusing on Christmas. And so this is just Sermon on the Mount Part 1. We'll, we'll finish Part 2 next year sometime. And so the, it's the best-known section of Jesus' teachings ever. If you have a, a red-letter Bible, anybody have a Bible where Jesus' words are in red? If you didn't know why these words are in red, that's why they're in red, by the way, because they're the words that Jesus himself spoke. If you turn to the Sermon on the Mount, all red, like it's just all red words. So that, that's why it's so popular, because it, these are words straight from Jesus' mouth. It is known as the Sermon on the Mount, and it is a sermon in that they are teachings from Jesus to us, 
to the people who were hearing him that day and also to us still today. So it is a sermon in that regard, but it's not a sermon in that he has three points and they all start with the same letter. So it it is a sermon, but it's not a sermon. So today, really what we're going to do is we're going to start learning about the sermon. So this sermon is a sermon on the sermon. This is an introduction to the sermon on the mount. And so in order to understand the sermon on the mount, you have to understand the overarching grand narrative of the entire Bible. That's really what you have to understand in order to truly interpret and understand what Jesus is saying here. And the essential theme of the Bible from beginning to end is God calling out a people as his people. And this people is to be a holy people. They are to be a set apart people, not separate. Remember, we talked about that last week, how being different is not always being separate. They are to be set apart. They are to be different in what they do, what they are about, their purpose, their hope, their joy, all of those things. So when God, if we can go back, okay, let's go back and review a little history. When God rescues his people from slavery, when they were in Egypt, okay, now Israel has been all over the news this week. Many of you have seen a lot of maps, and so now you have a better understanding of where everything is going on. Well, Israel has always been God's people, And when they were in slavery in Egypt, and you're like, okay, well, now that makes sense because Egypt is just like right there. They were in slavery. They got kicked out of their home and moved over to Egypt, and they were in slavery under Pharaoh. And God rescues them through Moses in Egypt from Pharaoh. You know the story. It really happened. Okay, it's not just a movie, not just a story. It really happened. God rescues them, and after he rescues them in the process of bringing them back home into the land that they would be, he makes a covenant with them. And he says this in Leviticus chapter 18, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instruction to the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God, so don't act like the people in Egypt where you used to live, or Like the people of Canaan, where I am taking you, you must not imitate their way of life. You must obey all of my regulations and be careful to obey my decrees, for I am the Lord your God. So God says to the people that he just rescued, hey, I don't want you to act like those Egyptians where you just came from. And I don't want you to act like those Canaanites where where you are going. I want you to act like me. I want you to act like my people. Because you're not Egyptian and you're not Canaanite. You're God's chosen people. Now, we know from history and the Bible that they did not. They repeatedly did not act like God. They kept picking up traditions and customs of everyone that they were around. They kept conforming to the pattern of the world in which they were, okay? And God kept having to remind them. We read in Psalm 106, 34, says, Israel failed to destroy the nations in the land as the Lord had commanded them. Instead, they mingled among the pagans and adopted their evil customs. They worshiped their idols, which led to their downfall. And over and over and over again, Israel did this. And over and over and over again, God sent people, we know them as prophets, If you read through the Old Testament and you get to that section where it's just a lot of little books and they all have somebody's name on them, those are the prophets. And God raised up prophets to to go to the nation of Israel and say, hey, do you remember what God promised you, what God said? You're not living that way. You need to live that way. And they would be like, oh, you're totally right. And they would repent and they would go back to God and that would last for a short time. And then they would just go back to the way they used to live, and then God would call up another prophet, and then that prophet would come along and say, hey, remember what God said? And this happened over and over and over again. And over and over and over again, they just forgot. They just forgot. They just kept going back. 
We read in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7, This disaster came upon the people of Israel because they worshipped other gods. They sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them safely out of Egypt and had rescued them from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. They had followed the practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of them, as well as the practice the kings of Israel had introduced. All of this history is actually very important to know if we're going to understand the Sermon on the Mount. Because when we hear Jesus' words, these are the first words of Jesus that we hear in the Gospel of Matthew. When we hear these words, it has been well over 400 years before, since God had said anything. And so remember, I told you that God kept raising up these prophets, and he did, over and over and over again, until he stopped. And he's like, well, I guess you're not going to listen to me. And then it was 400 years of silence. Nobody spoke up on God's behalf. Nobody wrote anything. God did not command anyone to, to write on stone or any parchment anything that he had said. He just was silent for 400 years. And the next thing we see are shepherds in the field at night keeping watch over their flock. And a baby is born. And this baby is Jesus. And this baby Jesus grows up to be a man. And somewhere around the age of 30 begins his public ministry. He's baptized by John. He, he's then immediately taken off into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights and is successful. He comes back. He starts healing people. And he begins his public ministry. And he basically starts telling people, hey, I know it's been a while. God's been silent for a long time. But you know that coming Messiah you guys have always been looking forward to? Yeah, he's here. And I'm him. Surprise! I came in about 30 years ago, but you guys all missed it. It's me. I'm the Messiah. And we see right before the Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew chapter 5, we read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus says, from then on, or, or it says about Jesus, from then on he began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, when it says near, don't think coming soon. Think proximity. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus is preaching. The kingdom of heaven is near, meaning the kingdom of heaven is here. And I am he. I am the kingdom of heaven. Okay? It's not coming soon anymore. It's been coming soon for over 400 years. But it's here now. And I am he. And then he says, repent, right, of your sins and turn to God. And again, when you, when you see the word repent, hang on, there's a fly. We're going to be friends for a while, I bet. When you see the word repent, don't think, oh, I just need to fall on my face and be super sorrowful for my sins. Listen, that's part of repentance. But repentance is more than that. The word that he uses is the Greek word metanoeo. That's just a fun word to say, metanoeo. Just throw that at somebody during lunch tomorrow. It means a complete change of mind and purpose. A total change of mind and purpose. So the Sermon on the Mount describes what it looks like when people have a complete change of mind and purpose to the point where they place themselves under the gracious authority of God. And what does it look when an entire group of people come to a complete change of mind to the point where they place themselves under the gracious authority of God? What do they look like? I'll tell you what they look like. They look different. They look different. They don't look like everybody else around them. They don't look like the, the nation around them. They look like a set-apart, holy people of God. That's what they look like. So track with me here. From Genesis, from the beginning, all the way to the end of the Old Testament, God has been trying to get his people to stand out 
to be different, to look different, from be different around the broken world around them. And then Jesus shows up after 400 years of silence, and the first thing we hear from him is a sermon where he says, essentially, be different. It's the same message that Jesus starts telling that God has been trying to tell from the beginning. You are my people. I choose you. And because I choose you, you are holy. And that holiness ought to cause you to look different, to be different. Jesus was calling them to rise above their pagan neighbors and be different. And he's calling us to do the same today. So if you read through the Sermon on the Mount, you'll notice that every, almost every paragraph, sometimes every, every verse, kind of draws this distinction between this Christian thought and this non-Christian thought, or a, a believer mindset and a pagan mindset, someone who, who follows after God and someone who maybe doesn't even believe in God, right? There's this distinction of attitudes and behaviors and everything all throughout it. In fact, the call to be different is the underlying and unifying theme of the entire sermon, the whole thing. That's the main theme. Not only the call to be different, but examples of how to live it out in real life. Sermon on the Mount is actually very practical, as you'll see as we start going through it. Just to give you some examples, pagans are said to love and salute each other. Christians are called to love their enemies. Pagans pray to be fashionable and eloquent. Christians are to pray as humble children. Pagans are preoccupied with seeking material possessions. Christians are to seek God and his righteousness. And while the scribes have loose and casual ethics, Christians are called to have a high level of morality. And Pharisees, although they have a hypocrite, hypocritical religiousness about them, Christians are to excel in their humble devotion. All throughout the Sermon on the Mount, you see this sort of, this is how we are called to be, this is how everybody else is. Don't be like that. That's pretty much the theme. So it illustrates how, Jesus, how the followers of Jesus are to be different. Different from those that just casually consider themselves Christians. They're Christian by name only. You know anybody like that? Don't point fingers. Oh, I'm a Christian. Are you though? Okay. But are you though? We're called to be different than, the, than those people as well as the people who wouldn't even, who don't even want to try to claim that they're Christian. No, I'm totally not that. Whatever the exact opposite of that is, that's what I am. We're called to be different. It's a complete value system. It's a Christian value system in a package is what the Sermon on the Mount is. It talks about our ethical standard. It, it tells us how to handle our money. It tells us what to do with our ambition and our lifestyle and our relationships. And all of those are to be completely different from the world around us. So here's what we read. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. We're going to get two verses into the Sermon on the Mount today. Now then, Jesus saw the crowds. He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So, recap. Jesus is baptized. He, gets in, he goes to the wilderness to be tempted. He comes back. He immediately starts healing people and starts kind of throwing out some, hey, God's kingdom is here, okay? Well, that's not what attracted the crowds, what attracted the crowds was Bill was blind and Bill can see now. Frank can walk now. Sally isn't sick like she's been for the last 40 years. Like that's what attracted the, the, the people. He was healing people and everyone, as you can imagine, it just developed this crowd. People were following Jesus everywhere he went. The crowds were getting bigger and bigger. And when Jesus sees the crowds, he goes up on the mountainside and he sits down and his disciples come to him and he begins teaching them. And that's when we get the Sermon on the Mount. Many have asked, is the Sermon on the Mount relevant? Because, you know, that was a long time ago. That was like 2,000 years ago these words were written down. Jesus said them even a little longer than that ago. 
Like, what is that? How does that help us today? Jesus never had to go through the things that we go through today. Jesus never went to high school. He never had to mess with a computer or an iPhone. He never had to learn algebra. He never had to deal with human resources or fantasy football league. Like, sure, this helped them, but what, what does this have for us today? Like, like, culture's different. Everything's different. What could he possibly have for us today? Well, I don't know. Only you can be the judge of what's relevant in your life. But let me ask you this. Are these things relevant to you? Because these are the things that the Sermon on the Mount covers. Your character, your influence, your morality, your devotion to faith, your ambition, your relationships, your commitment. If those aren't relevant to you, I, I'm not sure what is. So I think it might be relevant. Others have asked, is the Sermon on the Mount practical? Like, yeah, it's great stuff. But is it doable? Like, is it just like pie in the sky, wouldn't it be cool if? Or is this stuff actually possible? Like, could I actually implement some of these things? Could we ever live up to these standards? Are they even attainable? Or do we just admire them from a distance? Some people have said that the, the standards of the Sermon on the Mount are attractive to imagine, but impossible to fulfill. Like, oh. That would be great if we could do that, but we can't, so we're not even going to try. After all, if Jesus really knew mankind, which he claimed to have, and we believe he did, if he really knew mankind, if he really knew man's bent towards egocentric behavior, then how in the world can we be expected to be meek? If he knew of our ravenous sexual passion, then why are we expected to refrain from lustful thoughts and looks and actions? If he knew about our ability to be absorbed into the cares of the world, then why does he forbid worry? If he knew about our bent towards anger and thirst for revenge, then how in the world can we be expected to love our enemies? So because of this, many have taken the Sermon on the Mount to be a dream that could never actually come true. So which is it? Is it relevant or irrelevant? Practical, impractical, possible or impossible? Well, the short answer is yes. Yes, it is. I love how author and commentator John Stott describes the Sermon on the Mount. He says, The standards of the sermon are neither readily attainable by every man nor totally unattainable by any man. To put them beyond anyone's reach is to ignore the purpose of Christ's sermon. But to put them within everybody's reach is to ignore the reality of sin. So there seems to be this middle ground, this tension that the Sermon on the Mount lives in that's not impossible, and yet it's not also completely possible. There's a tension there that it seems to live in. In fact, I believe there's really only one key to understanding how this tension works. Because if you don't have this key, you're either going to approach the Sermon on the Mount with sort of, you know, foolish optimism or hopeless despair. You're going to read Jesus' words and be like, I got this. I can do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this out. I can make this happen. That's foolish optimism. Or you're going to look at it and you're going to read it and you're going to be like, I can't do that. I can't come anywhere close to that. There's no way I will ever be able to do all that. And since I can't do all of it, why even try to do any of it, right? It's either foolish optimism or hopeless despair. Or... There's that tension in the middle. And the tension in the middle is this key. You have to have a belief in the necessity and possibility of your new birth. You have to believe that you need to be born again. That you need the all-encompassing power and righteousness of Jesus in your life. And you have to believe that that's possible that it's available, that, that he wants to 
That's why he came, right? You have to understand that you need it, and you have to understand that it's possible for you to have it. Otherwise, you're going to read every single thing that Jesus ever said, and not just in the Sermon on the Mount, by the way. Everything that Jesus ever said, everything that any one of his disciples ever said, anything that the Bible ever says, and you're either going to think, I can do this if I try hard enough, which you can't. Or you're going to say, well, because I can't do any of that, why even try? And you're wrong. Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus one night. Nicodemus was a Pharisee that came to Jesus. And and Jesus tells him in John chapter 3, humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Jesus is saying, look, there's only one way. There's only one way to to, to do this, and that's to have new life in me. To be born again into the faith. To be born into a knowledge that we are sinners, and in Christ Jesus, he makes us new creations. He wipes away that sin. The Bible says he takes that sin, and he wads it up, and he throws it into the deepest part of the ocean. Meaning, that's where it is. That's where it stays. And there's no use searching for it. You're not going to find it. Okay, It's not sitting somewhere like the Titanic is. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west, that's where it is. And we can walk in that tension knowing, hey, the bad news is, I was never going to be able to do this on my own in the first place. The good news is, with Jesus... I can accomplish this. I can read these standards and I can live this way and I can appear to be set apart. I can appear to be different. I can allow the Holy Spirit to work in my life to where I'm not living this pie-in-the-sky crazy life. I'm living the same life that you guys are living. But I'm living it in such a way that has hope and peace and purpose and passion and reason and, and, and a future and faith and belief and patience and holiness, all of those things. But you have to believe that Jesus is able to do something in you and through you that you have not been able to do. Do you believe that Jesus can do something in you that you cannot do in yourself? That's a great step to be. That's a great place to be. So I'm just going to ask, if you're here and you want to believe that Jesus can do something in you that you've already tried, and you know you can't do it in yourself, and you're going to read these words over the next few weeks, and they're going to frustrate you to no end. I promise you that. Because they're going to seem impossible. And they are without Jesus. Jesus. And so if that's you, I just encourage you, take that card, take that next steps card and just just mark on that. Hey, I I, want to talk about Jesus today with somebody. I want to give my life to Jesus or I want to talk to somebody about giving my life to Jesus. And what I encourage you to do, number one, is put your name on that card because that's going to be frustrating for us if we don't know who filled that card out. But take that card and do one of two things. Either drop it in one of the generosity boxes before you leave and we'll be in contact with you. Or take it back here to the prayer point during this last song. Which, by the way, we're singing about our belief. I believe. Let this last song be your cry that today I believe. So take it back there to the prayer point. We have somebody back there who would love to talk with you about that. My prayer for us during this series that we're going to be is that we understand it to a point where it actually makes a difference in our life. Because if there was a key verse in the whole three chapters that we're going to be covering, and it is exhaustive, okay? It it is just so much stuff here. That's why it's going to take us forever to get through it. Not forever, but longer than a few weeks. But if there's a key verse, it's Matthew 6, 
verse 8. And it says this, do not be like them. We, like who? Like the world around you who focuses on the wrong things, spends their money on the wrong things, lives the wrong way, be who I called you to be. My people, a holy people, set apart. Let's pray. God, as we begin to look into what the words of Jesus over the next few weeks, I pray that, that we see that, that difference very clearly. And when we see that difference, and we're either tempted to, to be foolishly optimistic or we just think well, there's no way we can do this. We are just complete despair. God, help us find that middle ground where you show us one step at a time how we can even come close to doing the things that you've called us to do. That's our faith journey. That's, that's how we are called to move forward in our faith. Not do it all at once and not to not do any of it but to do it one step at a time, one day at a time. God, I pray for anybody in here who who wants to take that first step of faith. Give them the courage during this last song to stand up and go back to the prayer point. God, for anybody in this room that wants to take the second step where maybe they've just kind of been gone for a while, they've been checked out, they've been trying to do life on their own, but yet they know you, They, they know Jesus, but yet they've walked away and just sort of gotten lazy. God, I pray that they take a step towards you today. And God, for anybody in this room today that is either hurting, doubting, they came here today not knowing if you're even real. God, I just feel, I feel like you telling me to tell them he sees you. You didn't know if he saw you today, but he sees you. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he says, one step at a time, one day at a time, put your faith in Jesus and allow those around you who know and love you to speak truth into your life. God, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.